Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, today we have a panel and we're talking about practical steps for recruitment and retention, so welcome. So I'm Hannah Hansen, I'm the business manager at the LIGO Lab and I'm moderating this session today. We have Lorna Campbell, she's also from LIGO. She's our HR staff relations manager. Virtually we have Joseph Anthony Gonzalez. He's the head of recruitment for Aura NSF funded centers. He'll be presenting on agile recruiting. We have Sue Brundage here at the end joining us. She's the assistant director talent management at UCAR and she'll be presenting on staff development. And right next to me, I have Jessica Cancel. She's the Chief People Officer at Woods Hole, uh, presenting on retention strategies. So we're looking forward to talking to you about um, some good topics today. I'm sure many of you have struggled with recruiting and retention. We um, I know personally struggled with recruitment challenges posed by COVID, and they have started to recede in some areas, but as recruiters and hiring managers, we're facing a new normal that can be difficult to navigate. Retention is an issue for all organizations as employees are reassessing their options and trying to ensure that they're well placed, which is why some of us are seeing higher turnover. Most hiring managers are not just working on finding new talent, but they are also working outside their human resource professionals to provide the right culture and environment to retain the strong talent that we already have. So this panel, we're endeavoring to share strategies and real life examples related to the topics of recruiting and retention. So a lot of uh, what will help us is some Q&A at the end and engagement with the audience so that we can work together to answer some of your questions. And we'll get started with Lorna. Thanks, Hannah. Hi, everybody. My name is Lorna Campbell. I am the Staff Relations Manager at LIGO Lab, as Hannah said. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about recruiting pipelines and some of the things we've been doing to uh, try to fill those difficult to hire positions. Um, a little bit of background information on LIGO Lab. Uh, we have about 160 FTEs across our locations. Um, those, that excludes undergrads, grad students, and postdocs. So we're talking just about, about staff members. Um, LIGO Lab has four main work locations. We have staff at Caltech campus in Pasadena. We have staff at MIT in Cambridge. And we have two observatory sites, one in Richland, Washington, and the other in Livingston, Louisiana. So we are a dispersed staff, and we, we have been since pre-COVID. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about recruiting challenges that we've had today, and quite specifically, uh, one thing that we've done to try to address this, which is targeted internships. I'm sure that we're not alone in experiencing over the last few years that some very specific technical roles have been very, very tough to fill. This caused us to take a step back, um, and amongst all the traditional recruiting methods that we've used and, and some new, slightly more uh, imaginative things, we wanted to step back and really think about how to find candidates um, through nurturing our own pipelines. So we started thinking about the type of people that we ultimately really wanted to hire uh, and why we weren't able to find them anywhere. Um, so we thought about where they began their careers and how we could use that information to go way, way back to the very beginning and try to create our own pipelines that will pay dividends in the future. So the key things that we've learned along the way over the last couple of years um, is that it's a long game. Uh, the things that we're doing now won't pay off for many, many years in the future. Um, but we believe from the indicators we've seen so far that they are going to be successful, some of them, some not so much. Um, and so uh, the other the things we've learned are that participation breeds participation, especially when it comes to mentoring and internships, where we've been able to find mentors to take on interns, to help build pipelines in their very specific technical areas, and we've seen success or what could be success in the future, we find that that tends to bring others in uh, who are curious about how they can do this themselves. Um, it's a constant work in progress. There is no out of the box solution that fits everybody. And flexibility is really the key. We're trying to be flexible, 
we're trying to be open to trying things and failing. And we're also encouraging Caltech, who are the overarching organization that employs all of our staff, to be flexible with us. And I'm sure all of you will understand that um, there's some diplomacy involved there, and that's not, not always the easiest. So. So uh, targeted internships and developing relationships. Um, where we first started with this was with a couple of positions that were very, very difficult to hire. Um, we had a position that was open for over a year. I think I've skipped forward a couple of slides. Maybe. Um, we had a position that was open for, for over a year. And so we really had to step back and, and think, why are we unable to find the right person for this position? Um, and so what we did was we looked at where people are being educated in, for example, ultra high vacuum. Um, we've now partnered with Normandale Community College in Minnesota, um, which is one of the few places in the country educating people in ultra high vacuum technology. Um, and we started a pilot internship where we started bringing, we brought this student, Tim, who you can see in the pictures here, uh, to work with our staff at Caltech campus. Um, he came for eight weeks in the summer uh, of last year, uh, and we found it to be a great success. So the, the pilot is gonna lead to uh, us doing this a lot more frequently with the same college. Um, the things that were successful for us um, were that our staff actually had a great time uh, with the intern, passing along their knowledge, really coming to understand that they are some of the world leading experts in ultra high vacuum technology and that that information is valuable to others and that they can pass it along and have a terrific impact on the lives of young people. Um, the student, Tim, had a great time. He enjoyed learning from our staff. And he's actually graduated now and has gone on to begin a career at a customer custom vacuum company in Minnesota. Uh, and the college were delighted too, because for them, they're using this internship as a way to recruit for their ultra high vacuum program, um, in that students who perform very well might be eligible to come and work with us at Caltech in the future. And so, as a result of the success, we're planning two more interns in January, the college are now talking with us about building it into their curriculum uh, so that the students can come during the semester, which timing-wise works a little better for our staff and allows for a longer internship. So as a result of that internship and its success, we've started growing the idea of these pipelines. And so we're now working closely with the US Chamber of Commerce Foundation, uh, who on their Hiring Our Heroes program. This is a fellowship or internship program where we can host for 12 weeks members of the US military in their final six months of active duty. It's a great program. There's three cohorts every year, and so they send us the resumes. We're able to interview different candidates and make them offers of the internships. Um, so sometimes we find we're in competition with, with companies that they, the service members might be more interested in working with, but we've generally had great success with it. Our candidates have been um, from those with only four years or so of experience in the military uh, to our most recent candidate who had more than 20 years of experience in the Navy. And so we learn a lot from these service members spending time with our staff members. Uh, in particular, these ones have been with our IT teams and our engineering group at Caltech campus. Um, the veterans or soon to be veterans are gaining valuable work experience. They're making valuable contacts. Um, they're working with people who will act as references for them in the future. Um, and they're learning about open positions because all of them are job seekers at the same time as, as being interns and fellows. And so they're, they're gaining great contacts from those that they're working alongside. But as being a, a small group on campus, there are many other open positions across all of the Caltech campus um, and at JPL nearby. So that's been very valuable for the service members. And then our staff are benefiting massively from their vast and unique knowledge. So moving on. The success of both hiring our heroes and our vacuum internship are allowing us to create more opportunities and recruit more mentors. Um, 
We're now creating more of a comprehensive lab-wide undergraduate and high school internship program, and that encompasses all of our technical and business openings. And so there's already quite a lot of support for academic uh, undergraduate research programs, but where we've found the most challenges in hiring have been in very, very specific, specific technical fields um, that perhaps don't have a natural academic route. And so creating these pipelines ourselves, we believe, is one of the ways that we will be able to um, ensure that in the future, five or 10 years down the line, um, we're gonna have invested in young people who've gone out to have successful careers in these areas that we'll be able to hire in the future. And it also helps us to fulfill our obligation to our surrounding communities by opening up opportunities at Caltech campus for students from our local community colleges, um, from other universities in the area, and to really open that door to Caltech to many more students from lots of different backgrounds. So there's a DEI element that's kind of baked into this program. Developing partnerships isn't easy or smooth. Um, building trust takes a long time, and you have to keep showing up over and over again. Um, you can see the photographs here are of many different events um, involving community colleges in our local area that we've participated in. Um, and so when they have an event, a hiring event, a, re a recruiting event of any kind, a careers day of any kind, then we make sure that we show up and we are there, we have materials, we have internships for young people to apply for. And so that really helps us to, to build up those relationships and hopefully will pay dividends in the future. So we're trying to bring all of those, the ad hoc internship programs across our organization under one umbrella program. Uh, it's also gonna help us track the data, see where these students go in the future, help us to keep in touch with them, increase the visibility of LIGO Lab in whatever industry those young people are working in. And that's particularly important in something like the area of ultra high vacuum, because we want to be able to attract them back in a decade or two decades, um, so. Uh, we've eliminated all volunteer positions uh, for interns and we're making sure that every single one of them are fairly paid for their time and also to create some equity in the way that these uh, young people are able to come to us. Um, so again, that DEI element is, is baked in. Um, and so this is just a, a list of some of the things that we're participating in over the next year or that we're cr um, creating over the next year opportunities. Um, I'm going to skip past that as I know we have a lot of content for you guys today. So just in closing from me, um, what we're really doing here is trying to create our own future ideal employees um, or at least contribute to their early careers. Um, we're providing opportunities. We find it demystifies the university and research field for young people, which is important. It lets them see the types of jobs that are available. We're not just hiring physicists. There are plenty of other jobs available at LIGO for people from all kinds of different backgrounds and all types of different disciplines. Um, we find that one thing leads to another, uh, and therefore, where we have managed to get mentors to sign on and participate in this, um, their colleagues see what they're doing and want to understand how it will help them in the future um, and, the, and the value that they get from it. And so again, participation does lead to more participation, uh, but it is hard work. Uh, and you do have to ask for a flexibility to try new things. And so, um, you know, like I say, it's not easy, but it's very rewarding work. And uh, we're finding that it's, we hope that it will lead to great successes for us. Uh, anyone who wants to, I know we're rushing through a lot of content today, and so anyone who wants to talk more to me about this kind of thing can access microphone. Or... Yeah, I have a quick question about the internship program. So we have an internship through the Marine Advanced Technology Education uh, for marine technicians aboard research vessels, and it's been wildly successful in that most of them are being hired directly out of the internships. Something that has concerned me recently is we target those internships for undergraduates from landlocked universities and community colleges, but the higher level jobs are still requiring things like a master's degree, and I'm concerned that we're improving our recruitment to put them in dead-end career paths. And I was wondering if you had seen something similar or if you guys have a planner strategy for combating that. 
I'm not sure that we're far enough into it yet to have seen an exact replica of what you're describing. Um, I would say that we're fortunate in that uh, we are reviewing our hiring processes all the time. Um, and because we're so small, I'm doing that as well as doing this. And so there's a great advantage sometimes to being little and able to pivot. And so, um, you know, we're de we definitely have a very close eye on our hiring practices, on making sure that we don't have any barriers to success for people that are unnecessary. If it do if a job doesn't really require a degree, then we're we're trying to make sure that those things are not in those job descriptions. Um, and so, so we're we definitely are prioritizing that. And so I, you know, um, I don't think I have any fantastic advice for you. Sorry, <laughs> but. I think my only advice would be to review your hiring practices with the basic and preferred qualifications, which is a big hurdle, I understand. <laughs> yeah, it's a big hurdle. UNALS is a very distributed facility in that there's no central governance. There's no one person that's doing the hiring. It's institutions across the United States, and it's practices that are national <laughs> that we're trying to, that seem to be a hurdle, in my opinion. I, I could definitely see that yeah, yeah, we to can get everybody together. Yeah, we can sympathize with that for sure. Um, but we found on a case-by-case -case basis just challenging the hiring manager who's come up with a job description on which things really are necessary is, is helpful. And so if there is an opportunity to do that, and I know each institution has, has different roles, and, and we're also um, covered by Caltech's rules for hiring. So sometimes we find some resistance to it. Um, but for the most part, when we challenge something and point out to people, this doesn't make sense. You know, why do you need this? Then people do come around, so... One more question? Yeah, I have one. Right. So, um, all right, thank you. Uh, either for you, Lorna, or for any of the other panelists, uh, I was wondering if you could take a few minutes just to address how you approached introducing the internship program within your own staff and, and how you recruited mentors from within your staff to participate and what how that, how that went, because that's, of course, another big it is part a of setting it all up. Yeah, nagging, I think, is the answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, for us, it was it came about quite naturally because we had this real challenge with hiring for this one specific narrow area. Um, we, you know, everybody was really open to the idea of finding new solutions to this problem, even if they weren't. You know, sometimes people would say, I don't see how this is going to help us now. And then explaining, well, it's not going to help us now, but it might help us not be in this position 10 years from now. You know, that really helped us to kind of organically grow this. Um, and so that's really my, my best advice there. And nagging. Yes. Hey, great. Do we have our virtual next speaker? Okay, great. Next, um, we're going to have Joseph Anthony. Well, let's kind of get started. Um, I am part of the panel. Again, first name is Joseph Anthony, last name is Gonzalez. I'm the head of recruitment for Aura, and I'm based out of Tucson, Arizona, and we'll move to the next slide. And I'll talk a little bit about kind of who I am and my team, and maybe talk just at a very high level in terms of my role at Aura and who I support. Uh, within the NSF funded centers, but um, Valerie Castillo Irigoya, who's not here today, is one of my team members. She is one of my senior recruiters, uh, and I have a very small team based out of Tucson, where we're both based. Um, if you look at the slide there, Valerie uh, comes with about 15 years of experience, has been working uh, in her previous roles as a talent advisor, a brand manager, um, as well as a brand strategist for Barry, uh, Fairy God Boss. Uh, woman-owned uh, organization. Um, and uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I've spent the last, I, gosh, I shouldn't even date myself, the last 30 years um, in senior leader talent acquisition roles, either with various uh, management uh, consulting services, with Kaiser Permanente, as well as with Humana. And then going back before that, some other Fortune 50 companies, Clint and Pace, Bechtel Engineering, and so forth. So I certainly have, uh, I guess, been down the runway uh, quite a bit. 
Um, and it's a little bit about, uh, for Val and I, we've got about probably 30 plus years of experience and we are trying to change things up a little bit at Aura as well as within the NSF funded centers. So I'm here to talk a little bit about how we're conducting our work today and knowing that we are still in some of the early stages of trying to gently disrupt kind of how we recruit um, within our centers and hopefully making some mild but meaningful impact um, and at the same time, using every opportunity that has gone successfully as a potential win. And how can we use that to help further shape and modify how we can improve our recruiting practices? Um, a little bit about kind of the, the work and the, in terms of the goal and the pillars that are center point for Val and I is that we really aspire and care that we have a seat at the table. Um, in my 30 years of career history, as well as for Val, um, I have always been at the senior leadership table talking about what the leadership needs are, what the management needs are, and what the future uh, needs are in terms of our talent acquisition strategies. Um, and we think that that is one of the most important steps or roles that any talent acquisition advisor, manager, or leader can have. And all of us wanna have a seat at the table to make sure that we truly understand the needs of an organization, so we can best support them. Uh, some of the pillars that are important for us that we have been focusing on over the course of the last eight to 10 months. Um, and since I arrived here just a little, on, just about two years ago, actually, is really trying to improve and focus on hiring manager engagement. One of the things, and one of my observations is when I first arrived at um, or in the centers that I support, is there wasn't um, a clear set of expectation in terms of what the role was around HR and recruiting, but also of our managers. Um, our managers are really important to us. Uh, we don't always get to pick who our clients are, but it's important that all of them are very happy. So hiring manager engagement is at the forefront for us in terms of what we find is a really important pillar to have successful work within our structures. Uh, most important for me is positive candidate experience. Uh, one of the observations, again, uh, in my early arrival is that candidate experience was not thought about um, much um, within or in the NSF funded centers that I supported. That's not meant to be a criticism by any means, but just it wasn't important. And in today's market, in terms of where we're going, who we're trying to recruit, the changing workforce, uh, the great pandemic, um, there needs to be a greater level of candidate um, engagement. That is something that has been really key for me throughout my history that really leads to a successful talent acquisition or recruiting function. And we are starting to make some positive improvements in that area as well. Um, automation and standardization, excuse me, standardization is really important for us. And we are starting to look at different approaches in terms of what we need to do to become more nimble and more agile in our work. And I'll talk a little bit about that in terms of the next few slides in terms of where we're trying to go. Um, any HR function, any recruiting function should really have um, a good core set of practices around selection rigor and compliance um, without being too HRE and too compliance oriented. It's still important. We need to make sure that we can clearly support the decisions that we're making and that we've clearly documented that so we can uh, feel good about our selections as we move forward. And the last important pillar that's really important for Val and I is really being able to speak our brand. Um, every candidate, every manager, every individual that has some level of interface with us wants to know that we can speak to our brand, who we are, what we're about, and that we serve as ambassadors of the organization, that we can speak to our experience um, that we have within the institutions, the centers, you know, the scientific centers or programs that we support, but more importantly, that we give you a good feeling about who we are and what we're about. So those are things that are very, very important to us as I kind of talk about the next few slides and kind of shape of where we are wanting to go and kind of where we are today. And again, as we move through the slides, it's really about giving you a clear picture, uh, not about me trying to insult or you know, say that we're not doing a good job, but we are one of the uh, organizations that should be uh, prime and ready for change if we wish to compete in this ever, ever changing environment. Let me move to the next slide. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what's important to us, our aspiration to move to a more agile recruitment model. Um, and we're beginning to implement some of those uh, early phases of work 
if you think about what every institution is doing today in order to compete is we need to be more agile. We need to have a model that is really more fluid, one that really allows us as we go through all the stages of recruitment that we're constantly um, reprioritizing, that we're constantly uh, improving processes, that we're constantly trying to do everything that we can to ensure that we can get from candidate identification to onboarding uh, an individual in our organization. So this slide kind of really speaks to the approach that we're trying to move to. And some of the early changes that we've been trying to make and also maximize on previous good process that has worked and continue to refine that. Um, a few points about um, kind of our book of business and what we do today is that any given moment in time at Aura for the NSF funded centers that I support, which would be Noir Lab, uh, the National Solar Observatory, uh, Rubin Construction Project, as well as the administrative and function uh, of uh, kind of corporate functions, we are probably supporting about 65 to 75 active recruitments at any given moment. Uh, that's not a a big book of business, but it certainly is a complex uh, book of business for us. And what we are trying to do with those recruitments is make sure that we are treating them all the same and that we could move through the process in a really successful uh, form. Some of the steps that we're beginning to do today with all of our client base is institute kind of our biweekly team meetings with our hiring managers to speak about kind of what their needs are, what they have going on, keeping them updated on our recruitment process. And we're trying to give them kind of weekly and bi-weekly reports in terms of what's the status of our recruitments today? Where are they sitting? What's being held up? Where are they being held up in the process so that we can kind of keep that cycle uh, moving? Um, and through the process of our recruitments, we talked about the candidate experience as being really important. We're trying very much to have continuous candidate um, engagement as well as candidate pipeline development. So we know that we're always gonna have software engineering recruitments. We know that we're always gonna have scientist uh, recruitments. We know that we're always gonna have some other key role that's important. So we're trying to keep that continuous flow of dialogue moving with our candidates through all phases of the candidate journey. Um, we're constantly trying to bring talent or profiles to our leaders where they're receptive so that we're not just waiting for when a position comes available so that we're not kind of uh, being reactive in our approach. Um, and as we move through the cycles, making sure that we're constantly updating uh, our, our updates to our candidates. So continuous feedback in terms of candidates knowing where they're sitting in the process, because previously um, candidates wouldn't hear from a, a contact until maybe the position had finished its posting or until we really got to the interview phase. So our goal is making sure that through every step of the process, we're actively engaged with the candidate. And that is a new practice and kind of been a little bit of a phenomena breakthrough with some of our previous colleagues that there was limited contact. Um, and again, candidates really wanna know where they are in the process. Um, and again, also as we move through the cycle, trying to ensure that we're really kind of keeping up to speed with market trends. What's really going on in, in the industry? Again, we're a scientific organization. Yes, there we know where we're gonna be recruiting very specific types of profiles. If you're a scientist or if you're an astronomer, we know where you're gonna be. We know we're gonna try and motivate you, uh, excuse me, um, get you interested in our company. We know that, but we're trying to recruit engineers or other hard to fill roles that are not necessarily in the scientist or astro astronomer track, we need to make sure that we're really keeping up to speed with market trends. Because uh, again, we are recruiting from those other industries and we really need to make sure that we're casting kind of the wide net and we're staying on top of all of that. And again, constantly validating what the market, what's going on in the market around compensation, around our total offering so that we can also sell and market that to, to our uh, prospective candidate base. Um, let's move to the next slide. Um, and actually, before we go, there are just a couple of things. I put some data to the side that when you've got an agile recruitment model that's really kind of focusing on all of these items that we've talked about, you'll see a decrease in the cost of hire, you'll see an improvement in the reduction and the time to fill, and you'll really begin to improve recruiter productivity. And for someone who has such a small team, 
we're trying to make sure that on the, uh, in terms of the kinds of work that we're doing, that we're doing meaningful work uh, that allows us to be out to market and not spending so much time on administrative tasks, but really trying to ensure that we are really doing productive work that helps us build the base, build the candidates and consult and move candidates through the entire process. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about current state um, of kind of where we are, and then we'll go back to some of the approaches that we've been using and how it's made improvement for us. So let's go one slide up. And we'll talk a little bit about kind of where we are today in the current state. Today at, at Aura and the NSF funded centers, we've got um, a five phase recruitment process. Uh, that is probably about three or four four steps less than uh, probably in 2021 when I arrived, we had a very elongated recruitment process. What I've tried to do is make some refinements over the course of the last uh, 12 to 14 months and have kind of moved us to a five phase process. But in that, within those five phases, we probably have about 82 steps that we're still needing to do to move a candidate through the process. And I'm just kind of outlining a little bit about where this has been a challenge for us and why we need to move to a more agile recruiting model, because it means that if we don't make a change, we're gonna be really uh, behind the eight ball in terms of who we're trying to recruit, when we're trying to recruit talent to the organization. So we've got five phases, everything from the pre-recruitment and strategy phase to phase two, when we get a job out to market and we actually start to recruit to phase three, when we're really trying to review and assess candidates, we're looking at the candidate interview phase, and then everything to the candidate selection and the offer development. In the world that I come from and where I've been before, the starting point for us is trying to fill a job within 90 days. 89 days is the number, but a little tricky here at Aura and within the NSF funded centers. Prior to my arrival, Aura was averaging a recruitment uh, time to fill of about 167 days. Uh, when I arrived, I found that number really, fear, it was disheartening. I got a little worried, but I thought, you know what? We can make some improvements. But what was really causing all of that? And so what I want to comment on is what those challenges have been for us, but where we have started to make improvements as we've kind of moved to this agile, some of the basics. One is that sometimes there has not been alignment with our talent acquisition strategies to the business or to the scientific center. So Again, when there's lack of alignment, um, that really can prevent our ability to get out to market. Sometimes there's been a lack of investment in training and development, helping our hiring managers really be the best that they need to be to interview properly. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do is put more steps in place to give our managers the tools that they need around proper uh, interview training. Um, also, what we've experienced is there was little to minimal communication and lack of full engagement throughout all phases of the recruiting cycle. Again, hiring managers not being engaged uh, with candidates on the front end, and then a lot of calendar challenges. Um, this is kind of where we are today, but we're starting to see improvements, and we'll talk more about that. Sometimes also an overcomplication of the down selection process and candidate evaluation scorecards. You know, too many evaluating talent. Um, and what I've noticed is that in selection, what we're trying to do is teach it like a science that, you know, we're coming up with all of these unique approaches in terms of why we need to select a candidate. It doesn't need to be a science, but what it really needs to focus on is a robust process. And so that's what we're really trying to focus on as we move forward. But in the current state, we still get hung up because sometimes we spend too much time really over, over evaluating candidates. Um, also, a misconception that everyone in the interview committee process is a decision maker. Um, large interview committees, sometimes consisting of seven plus interviewers. You know, that's a challenge. That can also be a challenge for the candidates as they're going through the process. So what we're really trying to do is begin to change that as well and be more agile in terms of what we're doing um, and how we're inviting people to be a part of that process. Also trying to change everything around uh, from being a manual institution, but one that's really trying to use automation uh, and standardization. One of the uh, strategies that we've been deploying is in our recruitment team is certainly using our UKG and our uh, recruitment gateway, but also using a JIRA board and really outlining recruitment through all phases of the recruitment at that 90 day marker and really making sure that we've got watchers who can see the status of a recruitment, whether you're a hiring manager 
uh, you're another HR colleague who's supporting a step in the process, but one that you know what's going on with the recruitment, because if there's something that you need to contribute to the process, you can begin to support that effort so we can move everything through uh, the process. This is again about the current state, some of the things that have begun to uh, that have held us up in the past. But as we go through the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about where we've seen some improvements. Um, given I'm sorry, Joseph, Anthony, just real yep. quick. Sorry to interrupt. We're yep. going to run out of time because okay. we have two more speakers and we only have 19 more minutes. Okay. Um, could you um just move quickly through the rest yep, of your you slides. Bet. Okay, thank you. So as you. we go through the next slides, um, we'll give some examples of what we've done in terms of some of the agile steps that we've taken. We've got some engineering recruitments that we did either in my earlier arrival that were taken about 242 days. Um, today, uh, applying some of the agile recruitment steps that we talked about early on, we've been able to make a difference from 242 days to 45. What was success around that? Uh, engagement with the hiring manager, really owning the recruitment, clear alignment around what the role was in terms of the candidate profile, redefine, uh, redefining the uh, hiring committee selection process, so not seven members, but the essential few, and really tapping into previous pools. So sourcing candidates, going into past recruitment, and really tapping into what I call our silver medalists, people who were uh, number two and three, but they were very qualified. So that has been a success story that I think is really important. If I move to the next slide, one of the other examples that we've done has been the same around some facilities roles that we've done. Previous recruitments, 125 days. More recently in the last four months, taking some of these agile steps, again, implementing the biweekly recruitment updates, direct sourcing and mining of talent, going to very targeted pools, creating a base. Um, Re-engaging with the manager to make sure that he or she can move the recruitment through the process. Again, clear alignment with the candidate profile. And then HR taking a more active role in competency-based uh, pre-screens uh, so that we can really assess candidates for skill, competency, and fit. And then shortening up the hiring committee to three essential members versus six, seven, or eight. And then having a backlog of candidates, two plus, who are ready to go should the first candidate uh, not uh, decide to work uh, come work for us so in those examples again we went from 125 days to 68 from 142 plus or 242 plus to 45 those have been a couple of wins for us as we move to the next slide i'll finish up in 32 seconds it is for us <laughs> in applying some of these agile recruitment steps overall quarter to quarter we did q2 2023 our average time to fill was 147 days we just did the data last week q3 2023 we're doing 92 days um that's amazing for us for aura for the nsf funded centers i'm so proud of my managers who've been working with us who've been open to taking some different steps moving things along that is a huge win uh, we're on track to fill probably three or five other positions in the upcoming weeks that we think will fill in less than 60 days less than 20 days and less than 70 days not every example is that way but if we continue to take these small wins uh i think by q3 of next year in 2025 my goal is to have the time to fill at about 62 days. So that's my goal. Wow. Uh, to the right, we've done some first generation recruitment activity dashboards that really are giving our managers and my team a pulse of where we are. This is very basic, but it's starting to just represent data of what our book of business is, who's moving things through the pipeline, where are things in pre-recruitment, where are they in the respective phases of recruitment. And we can tell you that our goal right now is about 37% of our active book of business is in stage five. So when it's in stage five, it means we're getting close to filling the jobs. So again, small steps, baby steps, applying some principles of agile recruiting to help us get to the next steps. Um, and our goal is that as we embark in 2024 is to totally reconstruct our recruitment model and really move to a fully, fully practiced agile model and say, look what happened when we took these approaches with these seven, 10 or 11 recruitments, then what we can do when we totally reconstruct and re, um, revamp the process moving forward. So I think that's it. So sorry, I hope, didn't mean to take too much time. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Sue Brendage. I'm putting on my auctioneer hat, so strap in because this is going to go <laughs> fast. <laughs> um, I'm the assistant director of talent development within our, um, our human resources group, and our team oversees recruiting, immigration services, training and development, um, 
employee relations and HR data analytics. So lots of work to do, but I'm gonna to focus today on a couple of my favorite initiatives focused on staff development. Um, when we were going through this pesky little thing called the pandemic in 2020, we brought together uh, uh, people from across the organization to develop a 10-year workforce management plan that identified where we are today, where we wanna to be tomorrow, and what that gap is. And so we came up with nine strategies, as you see here. And while there was a piece of staff, of staff development in each of these strategies, managing staff performance, increasing employee mobility, and developing talent careers really expressly focuses on what we need to do to develop our staff. Um, one of the programs I'm particularly proud of is um, our leadership development continuum. So when I joined the organization five years ago, we had just reintroduced Leadership Academy, which was you know, basically the de facto supervisor training. Um, and there was a little bit of a supervisor orientation. Um, but given that um, we all believe that the great leaders result in excellent science, um, we wanted to create a leadership development program that would span the entire employee life cycle. Our talent and learning development team is a mighty small one of 2.5, and so we've engaged partners across the organization uh, to build this continuum of development. So we bring students in in the summer um, for our leadership programs, and we partner with um, NCAR's um, education and early career group, and these students come in and learn things like what it means to be a leader and that there are different kinds of scientific leaders, emotional intelligence, how to give and receive feedback, kind of the basic skills that you need as you move into the workforce. Uh, similarly, our early career leadership program, um, our team would come in and train specifically on the leadership aspects, again, for people who are just embarking on their career and need to know what skills are important as they move through their career. Um, we partnered with our Office of General Counsel to develop legal fundamentals for supervisors, which basically outlines the legal and reporting responsibilities for our supervisors. I affectionately referred to it as keep UCAR out of jail training. Um, so we, and that's been very, believe it or not, very popular because the, our corporate counsel who trains is dynamic and interesting and fun. So people actually really get a lot out of that. Um, we developed the Leadership Exploration and Development Program lead for our basic supervisor training. Um, and then we also have Leadership Academy, which we elevated to more of a flagship program. It's a nominated process, so you actually have to be nominated by your supervisor and approved by the director to be able to engage in this. And it's really meant to be for people who want to greater re leadership responsibility in the organization, and it covers some higher level, more strategic uh, focus than, than the LEAD program does. We recently added um, a, kind of an additional uh, benefit to folks who have been through LEAD or Leadership Academy. Uh, we have leadership circles, which are basically peer learning groups. People who have, are alumni of these programs come together and talk about their issues and challenges, share best practices, and basically support one another so they have that continuing uh, community of leaders across the organization. We've also started supervisor forums, which are for all supervisors, regardless of whether you've been through these programs. And those are for timely topics like performance evaluation or benefits, open enrollment, um, or how to manage staff in a hybrid work environment, for example. And then finally, uh, we are embarking right now on a senior leadership development program. We're hoping to launch that later this year. That's gonna be for assistant and deputy directors and above all the way up to the C-suite. And of course, focusing on those more strategic aspects. Um, as you can see, over the past couple of years, we've moved from in-person to online and then back into kind of a hybrid focus where we have some people meeting in person, some people online, um, and it's been very successful. We've had a lot of um, compliments about this program, um, but we also get a lot of constructive feedback, so we're continually refining this. And I just love this slide, so I wanted to share with it. It was adapted from a Battelle supervisor training, um, but it really does show um, how important it is to focus on not just the technical aspects, but also um, give people inter interpersonal skills, communication skills, emotional intelligence skills. And then of course, as we get higher up in the organization, we need more of that strategic focus. And so we try to meld those three components into our leadership program and shift the emphasis as we move up in the, the types of leaders that we have. 
Um, so that was the, the, the quick and <laughs> dirty version of our leadership program. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about our staff mentoring program. It started a couple of years ago um, as an, um, kind of an outbranching of a pilot program that happened in one of our labs that one of our scientists had, um, had started and, and was very successful. And we wanted to pilot that across the organization. So we hired a part-time mentoring program lead. She comes from the Naval Academy as a faculty member and had started and ran a, um, a mentoring group for women in aviation. So she's very well qualified to, uh, to run this program. Uh, one of the things that we think uh, makes this program such a success is the rigor that she's put into this program. Um, we have a steering committee. We have um, volunteers. Uh, we do some nagging, too, <laughs> to get folks to participate. Um, we do a very robust matching process because we're looking at demographics. We're looking at where people are in the organization, where they are in their career, what they're interested in. And as a result, we've had very few mentor-mentee failures. Um, everybody is really happy. Most people are happy with their their mentors and the mentees. Um, we also provide lots of tools, a curated LinkedIn learning path that all of our staff can uh, access. Um, templates for relationship building, for how, how you have a conversation with your mentees. So it, it not only is an opportunity for people to learn how to mentor and, and also people how to learn how to be mentored. Um, we also have a lot of communication channels for this. And um, to the extent that we can, we have an in-person celebration at the end of each cohort. So just, uh, just some uh, stats on this. We've had to date in three of our cohorts, 167 participants. So that's you know, a little bit more than 10% of, um, of our staff. Um, we did expand the cohort to nine months uh, to accommodate you know, field campaigns and uh, summer vacation and so forth. Um, we really focused this to be a organization-wide program for all types of staff, but we're really proud that a lot of our um, scientific software engineers, their STEM staff, are, are focused on this program. Um, one of the things that is a high priority for NCAR is a multi uh, interdisciplinary and collaborative science and convergent science. And so as you can see by the really tiny chart that, that we do a lot of cross-pollination between our different labs and programs so people get that kind of exposure uh, across the program. Um, we've had a lot of, of kudos on that and, and we do a, uh, a, an impact assessment at the end of each one. And these are some of the things that people have said. Um, one person actually managed to raise their performance rating because their mentor helped them, you know, craft and, and advocate for themselves the, the self-evaluation that helped with that. Um, another person received a promotion. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of collaboration that happens in these groups and, and new relationships are built. Um, another person joined a professional organization and we continually get um, rave reviews on this program. Some of the challenges, of course, is that we've got a part-time program director. Um, people are you know, time stretched and um, we often have an easier time finding mentees than we do finding mentors. And so that's something that we're continually working on. But we're embarking on a, uh, a retirement revamp, um, another initiative, and we're hoping to bring in people who are either about to retire or, or who have retired to bring them back to mentor on either their subject matter expertise or what it's like to retire as a scientist or a, um, a software engineer and, and what that journey is like. So... Um, that's not the only thing we do. These are all of the, the other kind of in, uh, development activities that we have. Um, but I would say that our leadership development and our staff mentoring program are, um, are my favorites. And um, they've been really successful. And since I didn't get to go into a lot of detail, uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Or I would love to exchange ideas about either leadership development or staff mentoring. And... Hi, everybody. About 30 seconds per slide. Got it. <laughs> Jessica Cancel, uh, Chief People Officer with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Quickly, we're about 1,200 employees. We focus on science, research, the ocean, uh, technology, and engineering. Uh, most of our employees are just as I mentioned, scientists, engineers, uh, support staff, and then also our educational components, students, and postdoctoral. Um, kind of summarizing everything that you've heard today, really the, the effort in recruiting, the goal is ultimately to retain that talent. And so I'm going to 
lifted up about 50,000 feet and really focus on an employee value proposition. At the end of the day, to recruit and retain the best talent, you have to know what it is that differentiates you from from your competition. And so intentionally looking at your employee value proposition, not just the money and benefits, but what's important to people. And from that aspect, it's the the work environment, it's the colleagues, it's all of the other things that you have to offer beyond the financial. But how do we know what matters? So we go back to research, psychology, to be uh, uh, Precise. So Maslow's hierarchy in the workplace, what's important to people? Um, we know through research um, that there are basic needs, and from there, before we can truly become self-actualized, before we can implement some of these mentoring programs and leadership development programs, we have to meet basic needs. We have to create a safe environment. We have to provide those opportunities to get together, to learn from each other. And so we understand that we have to start from the bottom up so that we can create create a solid foundation. And so that drives, that's our framework. But again, how do we know that the things that we think are important really are important? And so we're implementing feedback loops in every possible place that we can think of um, to have our team members let us know what is important to them. Um, we have five generations right now um, in the workplace. The value systems of each of those generations is different. And so one size fits all, fits no one. So it's important that we ask. And you have multiple opportunities throughout the entire process. We can ask candidates, and that was a, a typo on my end, candidates that we sent an offer to and declined. Are we asking them? So why did you choose a different organization? Money is the easiest thing that someone will say. But rarely is it the only thing. There's another need that wasn't met. Look through the entire employee life cycle and find out where you can sit down and get some feedback. Feedback, whether it's surveys, whether it's sitting down having a focus group during new employee orientation, are you taking the time to say, so share with me what your experience was like? What were the things that really attracted you to come on board with us? And what were the things that made you pause and think, is this the right decision? And so throughout the employee life cycle, you have an opportunity to gain feedback that ultimately goes back to creating your employee value proposition. And so the last step in our process, which I think um, Joseph Anthony gave a, a great example, is ensuring that you're measuring. Um, a lot of times, especially when it comes to the people skills or those things that are interpersonal um, and intrapersonal, uh, we think that we can't measure, but it's important to always be measuring. We bucket things into three different areas. Efficiency ratios, how are we measuring against external benchmarks? We, are we being good stewards of our funding? Then effectiveness ratio, are the things that we're doing, the policies, the processes, the systems that we have in place, are they actually moving the right levers? And then lastly, health measures, really looking at the culture of the organization, our community members, are they truly engaged? Do they feel like they have agency, a voice in the decisions that are being made? And so when you put that all together, retaining top talent, it's, it's a never-ending circle. Um, it is, uh, you, you look at that employee value proposition, you make sure that it's aligned to your values, mission, and vision. You, you measure to understand where's your baseline. You build from the bottom up, following Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You engage your employees in understanding what those things that are feeding into the employee value proposition are. What's important to them? We may think we know, I can guarantee you, our employees can teach us a thing or two. And then we go back and assess, is it actually working? Sometimes, yes, you're hitting it out of the park, like some of the slides we saw earlier. Sometimes it makes no difference. And so then you have to look, is it worth the investment or do we need to do something else? And then you start the process again. It, that assessment's continuously feeding your employee value proposition. You continue to move forward through each of the stages of Maslow's hierarchy, and ultimately you're able to retain top talent. I just joined the institution about eight months ago, so we are in the beginning processes of, of this journey. Um, so I am excited in the next few years to see how it unfolds. And if you'd like any more information, there's my contact.
See, we had a few more seconds than you, Richard, <laughs> left. So we did okay. So thank you to our panelists. We have five more. But, oh, we got less on the countdown, but we have five minutes for questions, I guess. Um, we have until 3.30? 3.25. Oh. <laughs> Dang. Okay, well, then you have to catch us out in the hallway. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>